Okay, so welcome to Learn English Network, English Book Club, and we are going to, I am sure, finish our current book, The Call of the Wild. We're on the final chapter, chapter seven, The Sounding of the Call. So it's all very exciting. <laughs> um, how long have we been reading this? Since January last, uh, since January, I think. It's, it's not that long a book, is it? So... Um, so that's what three months that's not bad going really normally takes us about a year <laughs> but yes it's a shortish book okay Eleanor um whenever you are ready if you'd like to start and, reading uh, so give me the last lines no we're we're on the chapter chapter seven uh, uh, I, I think we're at the beginning have... of the chapter aren't we the beginning okay yeah but... Buck sees Thornton's hand in his teeth. Thornton shook him back and forth as though animated, animated by a common impulse. The onlookers drew back to us. It was after the the fight, the um, I the challenge. Actually, Is that not for right, me, April? Oh, last week we we stopped at a lonely beaches, and now we have to start. And through another winter, they wandered on obliterated trail. Uh, now mush. Yes, I. The same impression that we have read somewhat from the last chapter. Um, maybe. Yes. Okay. But uh, I, I have read ahead and <laughs> I have forgotten to take... Okay. It that. might be. I, I might have made a boo-boo here. Um, I've put chapter 7, the, the sounding of the call, from now mush. So which bit do you have it as, April? Uh, we have to start with this uh, sentence. And through another mm -hmm. winter, they wandered on the obliterated trails of... Uh... OK, I will take... I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that um, April's far more clued up than me. <laughs> <laughs> So am I. <laughs> yep, Surely. absolutely. So we will go from there. Okay, Eleanor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And so another winter, they wandered on the obliterated trails of men who had gone before. Once they came upon a path blazed through the forest, an ancient path, and the lost cabin seemed very near. But the path began nowhere and ended nowhere, and it remained mystery, as the man who made it and the reason he made it remained mystery. Another time they chanced upon the time graven wreckage of a hunting lodge, and amid the shreds of rotted blankets, John Thornton found a long barreled flintlock. He knew it for a Hudson Bay Company gun of the young days in the northwest when such a gun was worth its height in beaver skins packed flat and that was all no hint uh, that, that was all no hint as to the man who in an early day had reared the lodge and left the gun among the blankets spring came on once more and at the end of all the wandering they found not the lost cabin, but a shallow place in a broad valley where the girls showed like yellow butter across the bottom of the washing pan. They sought no farther. Each day they worked and earned them thousands of dollars in clean dust and nuggets, and they worked every day. The girl was sucked in moose hide bags, fifty pounds to the bag and piled like so much firewood outside the spruce bow lodge. Like giants, they toyed, days flashing on the hills of days like dreams as they heaped the treasure up. There was nothing for the dogs to do save the hauling in of meat now and again then thought on killed, and Buck spent long hours musing by the fire. The vision of the short-legged hairy man came to him more frequently, now that there was little work to be done. And often 
blinking by the fire, but wandered with him in that other world which he remembered. The sailor thing of this other world seemed fear. When he watched the hairy man sleeping by the fire, head between his knees and hands clasped, clasped above, Buck saw that he slept restlessly, with many starts and awakenings, at which times he could peer fearfully into the darkness and fling more wood upon the fire. Did they walk by the beach of a sea, where the hairy man gathered shellfish and ate them as he gathered? At, uh, uh, it was with ice that roved everywhere for hidden danger and with legs prepared to run like the wind at its first appearance. Through the forest they crept noiselessly back at the hairy man's heels, and they were alert and vigilant, the pair of them, yes, twitching and moving and nostrils quivering, for the man had and smelled as skinny as buck. The hairy man could spring up into the trees and travel ahead as fast as on the ground, swinging by the arms from limb to limb, sometimes a dozen feet apart, letting go and catching, never falling, never missing his grip. In fact, he seemed as much at home among the trees as on the ground, and buck had memories of nights of virgin vigil spent beneath trees wherein the hairy man roosted holding on tightly as he slept and closely akin to the visions of the hairy man was the call still sounding in the depths, depths of the forest it fills him with a great unrest and strange desires it caused him to feel a vague sweet gladness and he was aware of wide yearnings and starings for he knew not what. Sometimes he pursued the call into the forest, looking for it as though it were a tangible thing, barking softly or defiantly as the mood might dictate. He would thrust his nose into the cool wood moss or into the black soil where long grasses grew, and snowed with joy at the first fat earth smells. Or he would crouch for hours, as if in concealment, concealment behind fungus-covered trunks of fallen trees, wide, wide-eyed, and wide-eared, a wide yet, to all that moved and sounded about him. It might be, lying thus, that he hoped to surprise this call he could not understand, but he did not know why he did these various things. He was impelled to do them, and did not reason about them at all. Irresistible impulses seized him. He would be lying in camp, dozing lazily in the heat of the day when suddenly his head would lift and his ears cock up, intent and listening, and he would spring to his feet and dash away, and on and on for hours, through the forest ice, and across the open spaces where the nigger heads bunched. He loved to run down dry water courses, and to creep and spy upon the bird life in the woods. For a day at a time he would lie in, in the underbrush where he could watch the partridges drumming and strutting up and down. But especially he loved to run in the dim twilight of the summer midnights, listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as man may read, may read a book, and seeking for the mysterious something that called cold, waking or sleeping, at all times for him to come. One night he sprang from sleep with a start, eager-eyed, nostrils quivering and scenting, his mane bristling in recurrent waves. From the forest came the call, on one note of it, for the call was many noted, distinct and definite distinct and definite as never before, <clears throat> a long-drawn howl, like 
yet unlike any noise made by husky dog. And he knew it in the old familiar way as a sound heard before. He sprang through the steeping camp and in swift silence dashed through the woods. As he drew closer to the cry he went more slowly with caution, uh, with caution in every moment, in, in every, every movement till he came to an open place among the trees and looking out saw erect on haunches with nose pointed to the sky a long lean timber wolf. Very good, well done. Okay, so, yes, that must be the call of the wild, hey? <laughs> um, a long, lean timber wolf. Could be trouble for Buck. <laughs> okay, nicely read. Well done. Okay, so. Here you are. I've got a little friend for Buck now. Oops. Ah, yes, I see. Yes, <laughs> Okay, there you go. Is he alright? He was smaller than Buck. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? But he's lean. <laughs> and we know that Buck is a pretty big doggy. <laughs> okay, so a couple of words for you. Alright, um, the first one is your old friend. And the reason why you can't ignore the old is because when you said toiled, it sounded like toyed. Okay? I see. So to toy with toy. somebody, but toiled. Try it. Toiled. Toiled. Is it better? Yeah, it's more toiled. Yeah, to toil. Toiled. Yeah. Toiled. Toiled. Okay, so you've got that all in the middle. Yeah. If you toil, it means you're toiling, uh, you're working hard. Okay. Toil. Toil. Can you hear it? Uh, yes, yes. I don't know that word, but uh, my pronunciation is a different thing, as you know, to words. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know it in theory, but in practice you say toyed. <laughs> okay, uh, the next one, I think you just misread it. Um, ah, yes, in, it he would, would okay. peer. It, it's not as in he would, you know, in the past. It's just that was his uh, habit of his, yeah? Okay. I... I, I, I Yes, yes. Okay, the next one, you've got to get the z. It's dozing. Doze, yeah, a nap. Yeah, uh -huh. that's it. Because if you say dosing, it's more like giving medicine. Yes, it's dose. Yeah, yes. okay. Yeah. So dose. try it. Okay. Dozing. Dozing, dozing. Much better. And then definite. You've got the nut at the end, not knit. Not definite, definite. Uh, definite, sure. Yeah. That's it. The schwa at the end. We love them, don't we? I know that all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the theory is great. The practice. <laughs> okay. Two smileys. Uh, vigil. Yeah. A vigil. Vigil. Yeah. Well done. Not Virgil. Yes, it's fine. Yes, yes. <laughs> Your classical coming out there. <laughs> and wide-eared. Well done. You you corrected yourself. Wide-eared. I don't know if why did really exists, to be honest. Wide-eyed, definitely. Oh. We, we have a saying, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. I don't know if you know this one. Wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. Uh -huh. Have you ever heard that one? No, I okay. haven't. Oh, it's a fun one. It just means um, sort of expecting something um, really quite... Um, and also bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, okay? Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, okay? Just means you're very eager for something, yeah? I was waiting for the uh, session to begin bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, or I was waiting for the session ah, to begin wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. Am I always? <laughs> so am I. <laughs> of course. Uh, Okay, and you then next eat. one, I just want to ask you, what do you think we'd say normally rather than, it's not often I, that you'd hear somebody saying it's worth its height in beaver skins, is it? What would be the more common saying to get that same meaning? Worth its height in beaver skins, uh, not very exciting. <laughs> was, uh, uh, beaver skins... Uh, uh, 
uh, one uh, on the other, and uh, it's about its height, how many skins uh, were needed. Yeah, so it's about the it. worth of the skins. Are you, you know, back then people was, traded uh, in fur much more than today. I mean, you can still buy fur coats, sadly. I prefer them actually to be on the animals, but, um, you know, some people seem to think it's oh okay. Uh, it's a difficult one. Um, they were not for me to judge, but I wouldn't personally wear fur. Um, so they were trading in fur. So it was worth a lot of money. But we wouldn't really say to somebody, it's worth its height in beaver skins. What are we more likely to say? Do you know? Any idea? No? No, no clue? Okay. Worth its weight in gold. I see. Okay. So Abba when something's worth a lot of money, or you just, um, I mean, sometimes you can say, you know, uh, your mum is worth her weight in gold, you know, because <laughs> um, you value yes. that person. <laughs> Okay. I see. Yes, I saw it's simply a metaphor, the first one, with its height in beaver skins. Yeah, right? they're, they're valuing something by what they were trading in, in those days. Yeah. Uh, and of course, worth its weight in gold has been around longer, because gold has always been um, a standard for value, whether it should be or not. I won't go into but <laughs> Okay, so, um, April, are Is you... The flat in the first uh, expression is that uh, the flat like in apartment, so it is packed by beaver skins. Uh, an apartment. No, no, uh, no I flat as in not. In... Yeah, sorry, Eleanor. Oh, sorry. Uh, I thought uh, they they were simply. This is about uh, uh, their surface. Uh, they were simply flat. Uh, as uh, they were lying one on the other. Am I right? Yes, absolutely right. When you stack something flat, um, it's why we call, you know, when you go to Ikea, I don't know if you know, if you, if you saw, there's a very funny um, photograph on the Facebook page, by the way, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, and we call it flat pack furniture in Ikea. Okay, so you get it in a box and it's all pla packed flat, one item on top of the other. Okay, is that okay, April? Is that so clear? it is very high then, so that's why... Well, it's flat so doesn't it. mean high, but if you put beaver skins flat and then stack them one on top of the other, then that height of beaver skins is worth a lot of money, yes. Okay. Okay, but flat, if I, um, you, you're kneeling at the moment, but you're kneeling on a rug and the rug is flat on the snow. Okay, it's not on its side, it's not raised above the snow, it's flat on the snow. If you lie flat when you're in bed to sleep, probably, I doubt you sit up in bed to sleep, so you lie flat. Okay? Okay. But now, why an apartment uh, is called a flat? Bigger. Um, the beaver, yes. I mean, the beaver itself can grow quite large, uh, but once you've skinned them, you don't lie the beavers flat you're actually skinning them and then like and then laying their fur flat okay so it's not a pile of beavers it's a pile of beaver skins okay hi mars okay oh mars you've got no white dot okay no white dot Oops. Check your settings. He left it in Skype, I think. Yeah, well, I've, I've warned you about <laughs> Skype, haven't I? <laughs> Skype um, really can mess your settings up. You need to know your sound settings for each thing, I think. Webinar Jam, that's one lot of settings. Kitely, another lot of settings. Skype, another lot of settings. Don't ask me why. It drives me nuts. And when I used to do Second Life and Kitely, that also messed up my settings. My settings for Kitely messed up Second Life and my Second Life settings messed up Kitely. So it's crazy. <laughs> okay, so um, April, whenever you're ready, if you would like to start reading, unless there's any more questions. question okay let me just close down i've just realized i've left skype open let me just quit skype <sighs> 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 <sighs>
meow. <laughs> I accidentally left it. I'm not on the call, but I left the actual program open, and that can be quite disturbing. You get those little. But who sounds. did the call then, Lynn, this morning? Who did the call? Because there is no no announcement. Let's start, and then uh, suddenly it is already green. Uh, telephone. That's up to Marion. That's her session. It's her session. I was just there lurking. Ah, she started. Yes. She yeah, started yeah, yeah. I've been training started. her how to start it. I mean, yeah. Normally, I put let's be. I'll I'll mention it to her just to type let's begin. She did actually type here we go, but she typed it in her own profile. <laughs> so she, I think she gets confused about which window she's in. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I think, think oh, was I think she started the call in no, but I think she started the call in wars to begin with, not in Mars. So <laughs> ah, okay. So I think she started it there and then went over to Mars and maybe had a little panic and just started the call. So, but it's good because she asked me if I could start the call and I went, no, you started. <laughs> As you know, I won't always be there. So. Okay, so April. <laughs> I I love these uh, sessions. They do they do drive you nuts sometimes. Though <laughs> April, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, he had made no noise, yet it ceased from its howling and tried to sense his presence. Back stalked into the open, half crouching, body gathered compactly together, tail straight and stiff feet falling with unwanted care if an unwanted care every movement advertised coming out coming coming out coming out coming out coming out threatening an overture of friendliness it was the menacing truce that marks the meeting of wild beasts that prey but the wolf fled at sight of him he followed with wild leapings in a frenzy to overtake. He ran him into a blind channel in the bed of the creek where a timber jam barred the way. The wolf whirled about, pivoting on his hind legs after the fashion of Joe and of all cornered husky dogs snarling and bristling clipping his teeth together in a continuous and rapid succession of snaps. But Buck did not b attack, but circled him about and hatched him in with friendly advances. The wolf was suspicious and afraid, for Buck made three of him in wait, while his head barely reached Buck's shoulder. Watching his chance, he darted away, and the chase was resu resumed. Was resumed. Time and again, he was cornered, and the thing repeated. Though he was in poor condition, or Buck could not easily have overtaken him, he would run till Buck's head was even with his flank. With his flank, when he would whirl around at bay, only to dash away again at the first opportunity. But in the end, Buck's pertinacity was rewarded, for the wolf, finding that no harm was intended, finally sniffed noses with him. Then they became friendly and played about in the nervous, half-coy way with which fierce beasts belie their fierceness, fierceness, their fierceness. After some time of this, the wolf started off at an easy lope in a manner that plainly showed he was going somewhere. He made it clear to Buck that he was to, ca to come, and they ran side by side through the somber twilight, straight up the creek path into the gorge from which it issued, and across the bleak divide where it took its rise. On the opposite slope of the watershed, they came down into a level country where were great stretches at forest and many streams, and through these great stretches they ran steadily, hour after hour, the sun rising higher and the day growing warmer. Buck was widely glad. He knew he was at last answering the call. 
running by the side of his wood brother toward the place from where the call surely came. Old memories were coming upon him fast, and he was stirring to them as of old he stirred to the realities of which they were the shadows. He had done this thing before, somewhere in that other and dimly remembered world, and he was doing it again now, running free in the open, the untucked earth underfoot, the, the, the white sky overhead. Um, oh. Uh, oh, sorry. I have to open the other one. Uh, chapter 7, the sounding of the call continued. They stopped by a running stream to drink, and stopping, Buck remembered John Thornton. He sat down. The wolf started on toward the place where, from where the call surely came, then returned to him, sniffing noses and making actions as though to encourage him. But Buck turned about and started slowly on the back track. For the better part of an hour, the wild brother ran by his side, whining softly. Then he sat down, pointed his nose upward, and howled. It was a mournful howl, and as Buck held steadily on his way, he heard it grow faint and fainter until it was lost in the distance. John Thornton was eating dinner when Buck dashed into camp and sprang upon him in a frenzy of affection, overturning him, scrambling upon him, licking his fa face, biting his hand, playing the general tomfool as John Thornton characterized it, the while he shook back, back and forth and cursed him lovingly. For two days and nights, Buck never left camp, never let Thornton out of his sight. He followed him about at his work, watched him while he ate, saw him into his blankets at night and out of them in the morning. But after two days, the call in the forest began to sound more imperiously than ever. Buck's restlessness came back on him, and he was haunted by recollections of the wild brother and of the smiling land beyond the, the divide and the run, side, and the run by, side by side through the white forest stretches. Once again he took to wandering in the woods, but the wild brother came no more, and though he, les he listened to, through long vigils, the mournful howl was, was never raised. Well done. He began to sleep. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> I thought that it was uh, it was a female one. Oh, no? maybe no, no, no. I don't think so. Because yeah. it says his wild brother, so I could only presume uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a male wolf. But maybe I mean, wolves and dogs will form packs, um, especially you know if they smell right to each other, and um, this wolf probably. If you read carefully, it's smaller than Buck, so it's probably quite sensibly thinking, "Oh, you're a big boy, aren't you? <laughs> do you want to play <laughs> rather than do you want to fight?" <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the um, text. A few words for you. The first one, it's a silent e, but you've got to get the d sound to stalk, stalked. Try it. Stalked. Stalked. That's better. Yeah, good. Stalk to stalk. Okay. Um, then the next one is on his hind legs. The hind legs of okay. an animal are the back legs, of course. Um, and we say hind. Okay. Try it. Hind. Hind legs. Very hind good. Legs. And then bristling is a silent T. A bristle and bristle to bristle. So like a bristle in a brush, that's the noun. To bristle when your the hair on the back of your neck might stand up. And bristling can also be a feeling of being annoyed. <laughs> but it's a silent T in each case. So try it. Bristling. Bris bristling. Yes. And again, unpacked. You've got to get that ending. Un Unpacked. That's it. Then frenzy. Um, it's got to be a z. When you said it, it sounded a bit, a bit like Frenchy. 
<laughs> I thought your French was coming out again. So a frenzy. 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 Yeah, frenzy. That's it. So like the um, what's that? Uh, Black Friday sales when people are trying to get the bargains. That's a frenzy. Okay. <laughs> and the next one, haunted. You've got to get that or sound. Haunted. Uh, yeah. Haunted. That's haunted. it. Yay, lovely. Uh, you get a smiley for fiercenessness. <laughs> Just the oneness. Fierceness. Okay. Fierceness. But That's there is it. another one, the, the difficult word, Lynn, with uh, mangled. Um, oh, what mangled. was it again? Mangled? Is Not it? mangled. Oh, uh, I don't know. What was it again? Uh, let me find it. Uh, it's so difficult to. So, um, ba, 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 uh, ah, yeah, commingled, commingled. <laughs> what oh, is it? Yeah, Com commingled. commingled. I mean, I I thought it would be commingled, but it's not. It is commingled. Um, not a word you'll probably ever have to use again. You'll be glad to know. But yes, commingled. Which means commingled. Yeah, it just means mingled together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then just um, how to say this last phrase? Okay circled him about and hedged him in with friendly advances so the wolf is circling round him and then uh, sorry buck is circling round the wolf and then hedging him in with friendly advances so not in a fight way okay he wants to get to know him but you'd say it circled him about and hedged him in with friendly advances try it okay Circle him about and hedge him in with friendly advances. Okay, try it again, but this time circled and hedged. You've decided you don't want to say the past tense anymore. <laughs> so, try it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> circled him about and hedged him in with... Uh, circled, him, uh, circled him about and hedged him in with friendly advances. Very good. Much better. <laughs> I'm being very strict today. <laughs> so, Buzz, I think you've got the link now, I hope. Um, okay, so you'll be reading and you need to find he began to sleep at night staying away from camp. Okay. Can you find that one, Moz? In fact, can I hear you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Lynn? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, oh, no. I pasted the wrong one. I mean, I copied the wrong one. <laughs> uh, trying it? to copy and paste it. Yeah, yeah you have to get the okay, right one. I bit. see it. You got it? Okay, I see it now. Excellent. Good, good, good. And... Okay. He began to sleep out at night, staying away from camp for days at a time. And once he crossed the divide at the head of the creek and went down into the land of timber and streams. There, he wandered for a week, seeking vainly for a fresh sign of the wild brother, killing his meat as he traveled and traveling with the long easy rope that seems never to tire he fished for salmon in a broad stream that emptied somewhere into the sea and by it by this stream he killed a large black bear blinded by the mosquitoes while likewise fishing and raging through the forest helpless and terrible even so it was a hard fight and it aroused the last latent remnants of box ferocity and two days later when he returned to his kill and found a dozen wolverines wolverines quarreling over the spoil. He scattered them like chaff and those that fled left to behind who would quarrel no more. 
The blood longing became stronger than ever before. He was a killer, a thing that preyed, preyed living on the things that lived, unaided, alone, by virtue of his own strength, and prowess surviving triumphantly in a hostile environment where only the strong survived. Because of all this, he became possessed of, the, of a great pride in himself, which communicated itself like a contag contagion to his physical being. It advertised itself in all his mov movements, was apparently in the play of every muscle, spoke plainly as speech in the way he carried himself, and he made his glorious furry coat, if anything, more glorious. But for the stray brown on his muzzle, and above his eye, and for the splash of white hair that ran midmost down his chest, he might well be, have been mistaken for a gigantic wolf, larger than the, the largest of the breed. From his street, uh, St. Bernard father, he had inherited size and weight, but it, has, it was his shepherd mother who had given shape to that size and weight. His muzzle was the long wolf muzzle, save, save that it was larger than the muzzle of any wolf and his head, somewhat broader, was the wolf head on a massive scale. His cunning was wolf cunning and wild cunning. His intelligence, shepherd intelligence, and Saint Bernard intelligence, and all this, plus an exper unexperience gained in the fiercest of schools, made him as formidable a creature as any that roamed the wild, a carnivorous animal living on a straight meat diet. He was in a full flower, flower at the high tide of his life, over, over spilling with a vigor and virility when Thornton, Thornton passed a, a caressing hand caressing hand along his back. A snapping and cracking followed the hand, each hair discharging its bent magnetism at the contact. Every part, brain and body, nerve tissue and fiber was keyed to the most exquisite pitch. In between all the parts, there was a perfect equi equilibrium or adjustment to sights and sounds and events which required action. He responded with lightning like rapidly, quickly as a husky dog could leap to defend from attack or to attack, he could leap twice as quickly. He saw the movement or heard sound and responded in less time than an underdog required to compass. The mere seeing or hearing he perceived and determined and responded in the same instant. In point of fact, the three actions of perceiving, determining, and responding were sequential, but so infinite infinitesimal were the intervals of time between them that they appeared simultaneous. His muscles were surcharged with vital vitality and shaped into play sharply, like steel springs live streamed through him in splendid flood, glad and rampant until it seemed that it would burst him asunder.
in sheer ecstasy and pour forth generously over the world. Very good. Never well done. Mind. Okay. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> well done. Nicely read. Very nicely read. And uh, yeah, it's very descriptive, isn't it? It's very so almost poetic description of a dog in his full, um, sort of full of strength of life, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me just scroll down and give you your individual words first. So we've got, um, I think you've had this one before. Don't forget, salmon, the fish, is a silent L, salmon. Oh, salmon. Yeah, salmon. I'm sure we had it with, I think it was Hiawatha. <laughs> <laughs> so salmon, <laughs> silent L. Then you've got latent, latent. Uh, okay, uh, latent. Yeah, li latent. You've got to get the tent at the end, latent. Okay. Latent. Yeah, okay. it means just not active. So, uh, latent, latent talent. It's there. You've got potential, but it's not been activated yet. Okay. So latent. Then um, uh, this next one, I, I, I struggled with it personally. I would say it's probably wolverines. Maybe an old spelling of it. Wolverines, which are like a species North American wolf. Okay, wolverines, like wolverine. I in, found um, it. Did you find it, Eleanor? Yes, but without pronunciation. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what was the explanation? At a moment, I will give it. Oh, uh, Cannibalous okay. mammal. Uh, it's just the same. Just, uh, just a moment, I will copy it. Uh, yes, uh, rare words. Okay. Of the weasel Nothing family. Very, yeah, uh, you see, again, I'd, I'd call that a wolverine. Um, they're not wolves. They're, they're more like weasels, as it says. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I tend to say wolverine. And if you've watched um, X-Men, like Wolverine in, in X-Men... <laughs> Ah, my wasted youth. <laughs> okay, so I'd say wolverines. I, I didn't find enough wolverines, <laughs> wolverines to, uh, <laughs> to convince me that it could be that. Okay, next one, though, is prowess. If you show prowess in something, yeah, prowess, you show a skill, yeah, real prowess. Uh, oh, prowess. Prowess. Yeah, prowess. Prowess. Good. Okay. Then the next one, um, contagion. If something is contagious, you might catch it. Uh, uh, contagion. <laughs> it tricked me. Uh, contagion. <laughs> I didn't trick you. <laughs> yeah, I thought it's a new word, so I pronounce it's a G, not G ah, sound. <laughs> yeah. The G, you have to know basically whether it's going to be a hard G, G, or a soft J. So, and this one's a soft J, contagion. Okay. Um, the next one is a hard J, vigor, though. Not vi, vi, vigor, vigorous. Uh, vigor, vigor. Yeah, that's it. And this next one is great. Infinitesimal. <laughs> Infinitesimal. <laughs> yeah, don't you love English <laughs> words like that? <laughs> it means very, very small. Okay. Infinitesimal. Infinitesimal. Uh, in, 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 infinitesimal. Yeah, that's why you need to know your your syllables. Infinitesimal. <laughs> okay, nicely done. Um, the next one is the sentence here. Um, you, you decided it was apparently, but it wasn't. Apparently has got a slight difference in meaning to apparent. If something is apparent, you can see it. Okay. And if you no. if you use the word apparently, it's more um, maybe not. <laughs> So it's more sort of um, as far as seemingly. Apparently is seemingly. So there's a, you're questioning it. Yeah? Oh, um, she is apparently from England, although she lives in Germany. So I'm not 100% certain. 
But when you listen to me, it is apparent that I am from the UK, okay? So it becomes more certain. So you can't confuse, you can't use the two in the same way, okay? There's more, there's less certainty when you say apparently. So if you'd like to read that sentence, give me, let me give that sentence, um, fragment that's been going around on English radio today. Uh, it was apparent in the play of every muscle. It was apparent in the play of every muscle. That's it. Good. Uh, now, the next one, again, it's about stress and intonation, because the way you read it, it sounded like this. It sounded like four days at a time, but it's not. It's for days at a time. There's a slight difference. Let me read the two out. Staying away from camp four days at a time. Now, that would be the number four. But how it should be read is staying away from camp for days at a time. Can you hear the difference? Uh, yes, it's faster for Yeah, and for days at a time. Uh, it runs through. It runs through. Okay. Okay, uh, okay let's try. Staying away from camp for days at the time. And then four days at the time. Yeah, for days at a time. So the, the whole series runs through for days at a time. Try it again. Uh, what is it again? Uh, uh, what is it again? Uh, stay, stay away from. <laughs> uh, it's noisy. <laughs> I, I can hear. Uh, <laughs> is it dinner time? <laughs> I don't, know. don't let Lyca like know. Don't let Lyca like know. She'll be over there. <laughs> is it uh, was apparent in the play of every? Huh? Stay away from. Camp for days at a time. That's better. Yes, for days at a time it means for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well done. Uh, okay. Thank and then the last thank one. You. The last one again. Your pronunciation was spot on. So we're getting more into intonation now than pronunciation. But this one would be quickly as a husky dog could leap to defend from attack or to attack. Okay. So that last bit or to attack stressed slightly. Do you want to try it again? Okay, uh, quickly as, has, as a husky dog could lead to defend from attack or to attack. Yeah, yeah, that's better, that's better, okay? Could defend from attack or to attack. Okay, so one or the other. That's how we tend to stress that kind of thing. You can do this or you can do that. <laughs> Okay, well done. Um, and I think uh, we're back round to Eleanor. Uh, oh, Lynn. Okay. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, April, you got a question? In this uh, sentence, what is save here? His muzzle was the long wolf muzzle. Save that was like Save that. Okay, apart from the fact Except that. Except for. Yes. <laughs> oh, save that. Yes, not save. It's save that. Like the position. Exactly. Except for uh -huh. or apart from the fact that. Okay. Okay. Oh. In other words, it was the long, it was just like the wolf of a muzzle, except, except there was a little, it was larger than that. Yeah. So you could say instead of save that, except that it was larger than the muzzle of any wolf. Okay. Okay, April? Okay, thank you. I, did, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, English. You can't, you can't translate it word for word. You've got to translate the whole thing and look for the context in the whole thing. Once you, once you start going beyond um, you know, sort of intermediate level, it becomes a little more complicated and everything has to slow down a bit. <laughs> Okay, Eleanor, if there are no more questions, um, whenever you're ready. Okay. Never was there such a dog, said John Thornton one day, as the partners watched back marching out of camp. When he was made, the melt was broke, said Pete. Pie Jingo, I think so myself, Hans affirmed. They saw him marching out of camp. 
but they did not see the instant and terrible transformation which took place as soon as he was within the secrecy of the forest. He no longer marched. At once he became a thing of the wild, stealing along softly, cut-footed, a passing shadow that appeared and disappeared among the shadows. He knew how to take advantage of every cover, to crawl on his belly like a snake, and like a snake to leap and strike. He could take a talmingen from its nest, kill a rabbit as it slept, and snap in mid-air the little chipmunks fleeing a second too late for the trees. Fish in open pools were not too quick for him. Now a beaver mending their dams too wary. He killed to eat, not from wantonness, but he preferred to eat what he killed himself. So a lacking humor ran through his deeds, and it was his delight to steal upon the squirrels, and when he all but had them, to let them go, chattering in mortal fear to the treetops. As the fall of the egg came on, the moose appeared in greater abundance, moving slowly down to meet the winter in the lower and less rigorous valleys. Buck had already dragged down a stray part ground calf, but he wished strongly for larger and more formidable quarry, and he came upon it one day on the divide at the head of the creek. A band of twenty moose had crossed ever from the land of streams and timber, and chief among them was a great bull. He was in a savage temper, and standing over six feet from the ground, was as formidable an antagonist as even Buck could desire. Back, uh, back and forth, the bull tossed his great palmated antlers, antlers branching to fourteen points and em embracing seven feet within the tips. His small eyes bent with a vicious and bitter light, where he roared with fury at sight of Buck. From the bull's side, just forward of the flank, protruded a feathered arrow and which accounted for his savageness. Guided by that instinct which came from the elk hunting days of the primordial wet world, Buck proceeded to cut the bull out from the head. It was no slight task. He would bark and dance about in front of the bull, just out of reach of the great antlers and of the terrible splay hoofs which could have stamped his life out with a single blow, unable to turn his back on the fang danger and go on, the bull would be driven into paroxysm of rage. At such moments he charged back, who retreated craftily, luring him on by a simulated inability to escape. But when he was thus separated from his fellows, Two or three of the younger bulls would charge back upon back and enable the wounded bull to rejoin the head. There is a patience of the wild dog, tireless, persistent as life itself, that curls motionless for endless hours the spider in its web, the snake in its coils, and the panther in its ambuscade. This patience belongs peculiarly to life when it hunts its living food, and it belonged to Buck as he clung to the flank of the head, retarding its march, irritating the young bulls, worrying the uh, uh, cows with the half-grown calves, and driving the wounded bull we met with helpless rage. For half a day this continued. Buck multiplied himself, attacking from all sides, enveloping the head in a whirlwind of menace, uh, of menace, cutting out his victim as fast as it could rejoin its mates, wearing out the patience of creatures preyed upon, which is a lesser patience than that of creatures praying. Very good. Well done.
Okay, yeah. so a couple of words for you, uh, which is great. Um, oh. Just the two. Well done. Uh, sorry, three. Uh, well done. The first okay, one, I, you I nearly got really it. Mind. Sorry? Uh, yeah, without P in uh, in front, isn't it? Well, it's it's um, a silent P. Ptarmigan. Yeah. Ptarmigan. Yeah. It's a game bird um, that people hunt for food, tar the ptarmigan. Okay. Do you want to try it? Ptarmigan? Yeah, yeah, I, I have found it, but uh, ptarmigan. Okay. That's it, yeah. Is and it the next one, one, it's not a silent E, it's dogged. 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 Yeah, I, yeah, yeah I, I don't know it. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So, dogged it just means you're very oh, uh, determined. Determined. Obstinate. Yeah, yeah obstinate as well, in, yeah. Uh, and the last one, it's not wind, it's a whirlwind. Well, wind, wind. Yeah. Yeah, wind, wind. wind. <laughs> whirlwind. <laughs> okay, so this weekend I was in a whirlwind of activity in the garden, in the house, but I still haven't cleaned my windows. <laughs> okay, very good. Any questions? I think uh, April will find more mistakes. Right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, I have the same as uh, Linz. Yay! Really... We are no in more. agreement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> You're safe, Eleanor. You're safe. <laughs> yes, but uh, I, I really feel, 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 I'm feeling good. <laughs> <So> far, <laughs> beyond expression. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so when we're ready, because um, I'd like to finish today, if you've got time, everybody, but I'd like to finish the book today. So, um, April, if you'd like to continue, if you've got time. Okay. Uh, page 10, 10. As the day wore along and the sun dropped to its bed in the northwest, the darkness had come back and the fall nights were six hours long, the young bulls retraced their steps more and more reluctantly to the aid of their beset leader. The downcoming winter was hurrying them onto the lower levels, and it seemed they could never shake off this tireless creature that held them back. Besides, it was not the life of the, herd, of the herd or of the young bulls that was threatened. That was threatened. The life of only one member was demanded, which was a remo remoter interest than their lives. And in the end, they were content to pay the toll. As twilight fell, the old bull stood with lowered head. Watching his mates, the cows he had known, the calves he had fathered, the bulls had, he had mastered, as they shambled on at a rapid pace through the fading light. He could not follow, for before his nose leaped the merciless fanged terror that would not let him go. Three hundred weight, more than half a ton he weighed, he had lived a long, strong life full of fight and struggle, and at the end he faced death of the, at the teeth of a creature whose head did not reach beyond his great knuckled knees. From then on, night and day, Buck never left his prey, never gave it a moment's rest, never permitted it to, bro to browse the leaves of trees or the shoots of young birch and willow, nor did he give the wounded bull opportunity to slake his burning thirst in the slender trickling streams they crossed. Often, in desperation, he burst into long stretches of flight. At such times, Buck did not attempt to stay him, but looped easily at his heels, satisfied with the way the, the, the game was played, lying down when the moose stood still, attacking him fiercely when his fiercely uh, when he strove to eat or drink. The great head drooped more and more under its tree of horns, and the shambling trot grew weak and weaker. 
He took to standing for long periods, with nose to the ground and dejected ears, dropped limply, and Buck found more time in which to get water for himself and in which to rest. At such moments, panting with red lolling tongue and with eyes fixed, fixed upon the big bull, it appeared to Buck that a change was coming over the face of things. He could feel a, a new stir in the land. As the moose were coming into the land, other kinds of life were coming in. Forest and stream and air seemed palpitant with their presence. The news of it was borne in upon him, not by sight or sound or smell, but by some other and, sub, and, subtler, and subtler sense. He heard nothing, saw nothing, yet knew that the land was somehow different, that through its strange things were afoot and ranging, and he resolved to investigate after he had finished the business in hand. Oh, it's finished. It's finished, Lynn? No. Ah. <laughs> What, I don't uh, have anything more. Oh, you run out of text. <laughs> that would yeah. be a funny way to finish the book. <laughs> You'll have to and go. And then to I this. have summary. No, no, no. It goes that. Oh, goes can you on. can you put it in? The, yes, oh. I can. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. I'll put it in chat bit by bit. Okay. okay. Carry on. At last, at the end of the fourth day, he pulled the great moose down. For a day and a night, he remained by the kill eating and sleeping, turn and turn about. Then, rested, refreshed and strong, he turned his face toward Kant and John Thornton. He broke into the long, easy lope and went on, hour after hour, never at loss for the tangled way, heading straight, for, heading straight home through strange country with a certitude of direction that put man and his magnetic needle to shame. To shame. Is that all? Oh. <laughs> As he held on, he became more and more conscious of the new stir in the land. There was life abroad in it different from the li life which had been there throughout the summer. No longer was this fact borne in upon him some subtle, mysterious way. The birds talked of it, the squirrels chattered about it, the very breeze whispered of it, of it, of it. <laughs> Several times he stopped and drew in the, tr in the fresh morning air in great sniffs, reading a, me a message which made him leap on with greater speed. He was oppressed with a sense of calamity happening, if it were not calamity al already happened. And as he crossed the, f the last watershed and dropped down into the valley toward camp, he proceeded with greater caution. Ooh. Three miles away, he came upon a fresh trail that sent his neck hair rippling and bristling. It led straight toward Camp and John Thornton. Buck hurried on, swiftly and stealthily, every nerve straining and tense, alert to the multitudinous details which told a story all but the end. His nose gave him a varying, varying dis descriptions of the passage of the life on the hills on the hills of which he was traveling he remarked the pregnant silence of the forest the the bird life has had fitted the squirrels were in hiding only uh, one only he saw a sleek gray fellow flattened against a gray dead limb so that he seemed a part of it a woody excrescence upon the wood itself. Very good. Okay. So Thank we haven't you. we still haven't finished the book though. <laughs> okay, but nicely read. Well done. So just a couple of words. Uh well, one word actually, so well done indeed. Um that first word is loped. To lope. 
it's what, what when wolves run they don't run they lope they sort of sort of very graceful kind of running okay loped try it lope lope that's it loped lope. is this lope. the past loped so to, oh. to lope. loped loped that's it yes yeah loped uh it's where elope comes from <laughs> to elope <laughs> to run away to get married yeah <laughs> Okay, the next one you get a smiley for is subtler. It's that silent B, well done. To be subtle, to do something subtly, and it's subtler than uh, other things. And then the last one, the sentence is, the bird life had flittered. Okay, so bird life goes together almost like it's hyphenated. Uh, the wildlife we actually is um, one word. And so you treat bird life the same. Okay, so the bird life had flitted. Try it. The bird life had flitted. Very good. Okay, Mars, um, have you got more text or were you like April? <laughs> Convinced we'd finished. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't follow, but I'm willing to finish if it's necessary okay uh, well and lind i have you want to. Uh, pronounced bristling correctly eh? bristling yes <laughs> perfect yes <laughs> okay so Mars, i from... think i have to, to do it correctly because you have just corrected me <laughs> oh yeah absolutely absolutely very important so if i give you the text then Moz, uh here you go we'd like to start reading uh, okay. that okay uh, okay if i I see it now, uh, as a buck slid along with the obscureness of a gliding shadow, his nose was jerked suddenly to the side as though a positive, a positive force had gripped and pulled it. He followed, followed the new scent into the thicket and found Nig. He was lying on, the, on his side. Dead were, were. He had dragged, he dragged himself, a narrow, protruding head and feathers from either side of his body. A hundred yards farther on, Buck came upon one of the sled dogs Thornton had bought in Dawson. This dog was thrashing about in a death struggle directly on the trail and Buck passed passed around him without stopping from the camp came the faint sound of many voices rising and falling in a sing-song chant bellying forward to the edge of the clearing he found hands lying on his face feathered with arrows like a porcupine at the same instant buck peered out where the spruce bow lodged had been and and saw what made his hair leap straight up on his neck and shoulders a gust of overpowering rage swept over him, he did not know that he growled, but he growled aloud with a ter with a terrible ferocity. For the last time in his life, he he allowed passion to reserve cunning and reason, and it was it, it was because of his great love for John Thornton that he has lost his head. The yeehats were dancing about the wreckage of the spruce bow lodge when they heard a fearful roaring and so rushing upon them an animal the like of which they had never seen before. It was Buck, a live hurricane of fury hurling himself upon them in a frenzy to destroy. He sprang at the foremost man. It was the chief of the 
ye hats, ripping the throat wide open till the rent jugular sprouted a fountain of blood. He did not pause to worry the victim, but ripped in passing with the next bound, tearing wide the throat of a second man. There was no withstanding him. He plunged about in their very midst, tearing, rending, destroy, destroying in constant and terrific motion, which defi defied the arrows they discharged at him. In fact, so inconceivably rapid, inconceivably rapid were his movements, and so closely were the Indians tangled together. Then they shot one another with the arrows, and one young hunter, hurling a spear at Buck in the mid-air, drove it through the chest of another hunter with such force that the point broke through the skin of the back up the back and stood out beyond. Then a panic seized the Yehats and they fled in terror to the woods, proclaiming as they fled the advent advent of the evil spirit, and truly Buck was a fiend incarnate, raging at their heels and dragging them down like deer, and they raced through the trees, it was a fateful day for the Yehats. They scattered far and wide over the country, and it was not till a week later that the last of the survivors gathered together in a lower valley and counted their losses. As for Bach, wearying of the pursuit, he returned to the desolated camp. He found Pete where he had killed in his blankets in his first moment of surprise. Thornton's desperate, in desperate struggle was fresh written. On the, on the earth, Buck and Buck scented every detail of it down to the edge of a deep pool. By the edge, head and fore, Four feet in the water lay skid feet full to the rest. The pool itself muddy and discolored from the sluice boxes effectually hid what it contained and it contained John Thornton for Buck followed his trace into the water from which no trace led away. Very good. Day, okay, uh, yeah. If you stop there, if you stop there, I'll do something slightly different to uh, towards the end. Okay, so a um, couple of words for you. The first one is when you're looking at a tree and you look at the boughs of the tree. Okay, so you've got the trunk of the tree, and then coming off the trunk of the tree, you've got the boughs, and then you've got the twigs. So it's bow, not like bow and arrow. It's like to bow to the queen. Okay, bow. Try it. Uh, a bow. Yeah, that's it. And then spouted, not sprouted. Okay, if something sprouts, uh, it grows like a. Um, you get um, a sprouting plant as it grows through the soil. It's sprouting. Uh, but spout is more to do with water. So when you've got a whale and the, the um, gas and water comes out of the spout of the whale, it spouts. Okay, so that's more to do with liquid. Spouting. Try it. Uh, spouted. That's it, good. And then tearing, it's from to tear, not like to cry a tear. Tearing. Uh, okay, uh, tearing. Yeah, so if you tear your clothes, you rip them, yeah? And you might cry a tear over your torn clothes. <laughs> and just be careful when you're reading that you read that, not than, okay? Quite often you do that, you, you just replace that with than. Okay, and then we've got a little bit about the tenses here. He found Pete where he had been killed. Okay, so here we've got it in the passive. He had been killed. We don't know who killed him, but he was dead. He had been killed by someone. Not he had killed. Otherwise, it would mean Pete had killed someone. Okay, 
but he's not he's dead he had been killed so that important so important to say he had been killed it completely changes the meaning of the sentence so try it he found pete where he had been killed he found pete where he had been he had been killed very good okay so um eleanor i'm going to do bit by bit until we get to the end okay if you'd like to start mm -hmm. reading and then i'll stop you after uh, probably okay. two paragraphs okay okay what was the last sentence uh you need to find all day buck brooded by the pool uh okay all day buck brooded by the pool around restlessly about the camp that as a cessation of movement as a passing out and away from the lives of the living he knew and he knew john thornton was dead it left a great void in him somewhat akin to hunger but a void which ached and ached and which food could not fill at times when he paused to contemplate the carcasses of the e huts he forgot the pain of it at at such times he was aware of a great pride in himself a pride greater than any he had yet experienced he had killed man the noblest game of all and he had killed in the face of the law of club and fang he sniffed the bodies curiously they had died so easily it was harder to kill a husky dog than them they were no match at all were it not for their arrows and spears and clubs thenceforward he would be unafraid of them except when they bore in their hands the arrows spears and clubs night came on and the full moon rose high over the trees into the sky, lighting the land till it lay bathed in ghastly day. And with the coming of the night, brooding and moaning by the pool, Buck became alive to a stirring of the new life in the forest other and that which the Ehats had made. He stood up, listening and sending. From far, uh, from far away drifted a faint sharp yelp, followed by a chorus of similar sharp yelps. As the moments passed, the yelps grew closer and louder. Again Buck knew them as things heard in that other word, which persisted in his memory. He walked to the center of the open space and listened. It was the call the many now that call, sounding more luringly and compellingly than ever before. And as never before, he was ready to obey. John Thornton was dead. The last tie was broken. Man and the claims of man no longer bound him. Very good. Well done. Okay. Okay, just the one word. And it's just bathed. Uh -huh. Bathed. Not bathed, bathed. Silent E. Ah, both, yes. Uh, be, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, April, if you... Oh, April, you haven't got any text, have you? <laughs> oh, I have I have that. I found it. You found Same it. Story. Okay, good. Yeah, good. yeah, okay. I found that. <laughs> if you'd like to read the next okay. two paragraphs, then. <laughs> okay. Hunting their living meat, as the yihats were hunting it, on the flanks of the migrating moose, the wolf pack had at last crossed over from the land of streams and timber and invaded Buck's Valley into the clearing where the moonlight streamed. They poured in a silvery flood and in the center of the clearing stood Buck, motionless as a statue, waiting their coming. They were owed so still and large he stood and a moment's pause fell till the boldest and leaped straight for him oh no sorry till the boldest one leaped straight for him like a flash buck struck breaking the neck then he stood without movement as before the stricken wolf rolling in an agony behind him three others tried it in sharp 
succession, and one after the other they drew back, streaming blood from slashed throats or shoulders. This was sufficient to fling the whole pack forward, pell-mell, crowded together, blocked and confused by its e eagerness to pull down the prey. Buck's marvelous quickness and agility stood him in good stead, pivoting on his hind legs and snapping and gushing, he was everywhere at once, presenting a front which was appar apparently unbroken so swiftly did he roll and guard from side to side. But to prevent them from getting behind him, he was forced back, down past the pool and into the creek bed till he brought up again, till he brought up against a high gravel bank. He walked along the, to a right angle in the bank which the men had made in the course of mining, and in this angle he came to bay, protected on three sides and with nothing to do but face the front. Very good. Well and done. So, hey, okay, yeah, yeah, stop. <laughs> okay. Um, no corrections. Well done. Um, the only thing, you, yep, that's pretty much perfect. So well done. Um, Moz, would you like to read the next two paragraphs? Uh, I, I lost it. <laughs> I must look at something. Uh, 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 let's stop. That's, that's two paragraphs, yeah, if you right? just read it from the text chat window, okay? Is it is it in the in the summers there is one visitor? Is no, it, no, is, and so well one? did he face it. If you have a look in local chat, you'll see it there, okay? Oh, and well, so, and so well did he face it, that at the end of half an hour, the wolves drew back, Comte competed, the tongues of all were out and lolling, the white fangs showing cruel, cruelly white in the moonlight, some were lying down with heads raised and ears pricked forward. Others stood on their feet watching him, and still others were lapping water from the pool. One wolf, long and lean, gray, advanced cautiously in a friendly manner, and Buck recognized the wild brother with whom he had run for a night and in a day, he was whining softly. As Buck whined, they touched, touched, noise, noses. Uh, is that it? Is that it, Lynn? No. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry. I thought you'd got it from the book. Okay. No. There's one more paragraph. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, then an, an old wolf, gaunt and battled, scared, came forward. Buck with, with it, he slips into the pre pre preliminary of a snarl but sniffed noses with him. Whereupon the old wolf sat down, pointed nose at the, at the moon and broke out the long wolf howl. The other sat down and howled, and now he in the call came to Buck in the un unmistakable accents. He too sat down and howled. This over, he came out of his angle, and the pack crowded around him, sniffing in half-friendly have savage manner. The leaders lifted the yelp of the pack and they sprang away into the woods. The wolves swung be in behind, yelping in chorus, and, ra and Buck ran with them side by side with the wild brother, yelping as he ran. Very good, well done. Okay, so a couple of little words, just a couple, that's all. And the first one, oh, discomforted. Uh, con D 
discomforted. Yeah, if you feel uncomfortable, you might feel a bit discomforted. Okay, sort of embarrassed or just um, out of sorts a little bit. So not comfortable. Okay, just yeah, you just feel uneasy. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the next one, preliminary. Preliminary. Yeah, preliminary, preliminary. Um, so what you've got is basically yeah. like a preliminary yeah. exam, the exam before the exam. <laughs> if you're preparing for something, you might do some preliminary work to prepare for the final work. Okay. 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 Good. Pre pre preliminary. That's it. And then just this, um, you just missed out the and on this one. Okay, one wolf, long and lean and grey. One wolf, long and lean and grey. That's it, yeah. And uh, get a, you get a smiley for noses, not noises. Well done. <laughs> when you make sense of it, you kind of think, oh, yeah, no. Because you could see, you suddenly realised, oh, no, that makes no sense. And so you were happy to correct it, which is real progress when you suddenly realize something doesn't feel right uh, oh no that's wrong i must go back and read it again okay so let's finish the book if you don't mind i'll read the end of the book and then uh, we're done and here may well end the story of buck the years were not many when the yeehats noted a change in the breed of timber wolves for some were seen with splashes of brown on head and muzzle and with a rift of white centering down the chest but more remarkable than this the Yeehats tell of a ghost dog that runs at the head of the pack. They are afraid of this ghost dog, for it has cunning greater than they, stealing from their camps in fierce winters, robbing their tracks, traps, slaying their dogs and defying their bravest hunters. Nay, the tale grows worse. Hunters there are who fail to return to the camp, and hunters there have been whom their tribesmen found with throats slashed cruelly open and with wolf prints about them in the snow, greater than the prints of any wolf. Each fall, when the Yeehats follow the movement of the moose, there is a certain valley which they never enter, and women there who, and women there are who become sad when the word goes over the fire of how the evil spirit came to select that valley for an abiding place. In the summers there's one visitor, however, to that valley, of which the Yeehats do not know. It is a great, gloriously coated wolf, like and yet unlike all other wolves. He crosses alone from the smiling timberland and comes down into an open space among the trees. Here, a yellow stream falls, flows from rotted moosehide sacks and sinks into the ground with long grasses growing through it and vegetable mould overrunning it and hiding its yellow from the sun. And here he muses for a time, howling once, long and mournfully, ere he departs. But he is not always alone. When the long winter nights come on and the wolves follow their meat into the lower valleys, he may be seen running at the head of the pack through the pale moonlight or glimmering borealis, leaping gigantic above his fellows, his great throat a bellow as he sings a song of the younger world, which is the song of the pack. And that's it. Oh, it's sad end. the end yes so thank you so much for reading it with me um next week we'll be in a different sim so keep an eye open for announcements and uh, we'll start by reading a longish poem if that's okay just to clear our minds of the call of the wild before we choose another book okay oh, i'm glad you enjoyed it eleanor but we'll be somewhere warmer next it week. Long, yes, really. yes, it's. Uh, I, I enjoyed it uh, very much. Uh, I I had read it as a child, but in Polish. Uh, Me too. Well, not in Polish. <laughs> yeah, I'd read it oh, as yeah. a child too. It's been a long yes, time since I read it. <laughs> in English, it's different. And, and I had you know, forgotten how. Well. well, I'd forgotten Comedic how brutal it can be. I had forgotten how brutal yeah, it can it, be. It, Maybe I was a bloodthirsty I, child. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, April, you said something? Yeah, it was only uh, 
two chapters, I think, we read today, and it Just took the longer one. than I expected. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it took longer than I expected too, but I wanted to finish because I knew there wouldn't be enough for a full session next time. So uh, thank you for staying on and finishing it. But yeah, I was a bit surprised. I was like, hang on, what's going on? <laughs> We were a little late starting, but even so, it was, uh, it did take longer than I thought. Okay, so thank you so much and uh, have a nice rest of your day. I'll see you around, I'm sure, uh, on the forum, etc., in the network. And uh, as I say, next week, keep an eye open for group announcements because we'll be in a different sim. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye, Moz. Say bye-bye to your doggies, Moz. <laughs> they, they provided great sound effects. <laughs> bye. <laughs>
The hairy man could spring up into the trees and travel ahead as fast as on the ground, swinging by the arms from limb to limb, sometimes a dozen feet apart, letting go and catching, never falling, never missing his grip. In fact, he seemed as much at home among the trees as on the ground, and Buck had memories of nights of vigil, vigil spent beneath trees, wherein the hairy man roosted, holding on tightly as he slept. And closely akin to the visions of the hairy man was the call still sounding in the depths, depths of the forest. It filled him with a great unrest and strange desires. Okay, so welcome to Learn English Network, English Book Club. And we are going to, I am sure, finish our current book, The Call of the Wild. We're on the final chapter, chapter seven, The Sounding of the Call. So it's all very exciting. <laughs> um, how long have we been reading this? Since January last, uh, since January, I think. It's, it's not that long a book, is it? So, um, so that's what, three months. So it's not bad going, really. Normally it takes us about a year. <laughs> But yes, it's a shortish book. Okay, Eleanor, um, whenever you are ready, if you'd like to start and, reading. Uh, so give me the last lines. No, we're, we're on the chapter, chapter seven. Uh, uh, I, I think we're at the beginning we of the chapter, aren't we? The beginning, okay. Yeah, uh, Buck sees Thornton's hand in his teeth. Thornton shook him back and forth as though animated, animated. By a common impulse, the onlookers drew back to us. It was after the the fight, the um, I have the challenge. Actually, Is that not for right, me, April? oh, last week we we stopped at a lonely beaches, and now we have to start. And through another winter, they wandered on obliterated trail. Uh, now mush. Yes, I. The same impression that we have read somewhat from the last chapter. Um, maybe. Yes. Okay. But uh, I, I have read ahead and <laughs> I have forgotten to take... Okay. It that. might be. I, I might have made a boo-boo here. Um, I've put chapter seven, the, the sounding of the call from now mush. So which bit do you have it as April? Uh, we have to start with this uh, sentence. And through another mm -hmm. winter, they wandered on the obliterated trails of... Uh... Okay. I will take... I, I'm, I'm... It caused him to feel a vague, sweet gladness, and he was aware of wide yearnings and stirrings, for he knew not what. Sometimes he pursued the call into the forest looking for it, as though it were a tangible thing, barking softly or defiantly, as the mood might dictate. He would thrust his nose into the cool wood moss, or into the black soil where long grasses grew, and snout with joy at the first fat earth smells. Or he would crouch for hours, as if in concealment, concealment behind fungus-covered trunks of fallen trees, wide, wide-eyed, and wide-eared, a wide yet, to all that moved and sounded about him. It might be, lying thus, that he helped to surprise this call he could not understand, but he did not know why he did these various things. He was impelled to do them, and did not reason about them at all. Irresistible impulses seized him. He would be lying in camp, dozing lazily in the heat of the day, when suddenly his head would lift and his ears cock up, intent and listening, and he would spring to his feet and dash away, and on and on for hours, through the forest ice and across the open spaces where the nigger heads bunched. He loved to run down dry water courses 
and to creep and spy upon the bird life in the woods. For a day at a time he would lie in, in the underbrush where he could watch the partridges drumming and strutting up and down. But especially he loved to run in the dim twilight of the summer midnights, listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as man may read, may read a book, and seeking for the mysterious something that called, called, waking or sleeping at all times for him to come. One night he sprang from sleep with a start, eager-eyed, nostrils quivering and scenting, his mane bristling in recurrent waves. From the forest came the call, on one note of it, for the call was many noted, distinct and definite, distinct and definite as never before, <clears throat> a long-drawn howl, like, yet unlike, any noise made by husky dog. And he knew it, in the old familiar way, as the sound heard before. He sprang through the sleeping camp, and in swift silence dashed through the woods. As he drew closer to the cry, he went more slowly, with caution, uh, with caution in every moment, in, in every, every movement, till he came to an open place among the trees, and looking out, saw, erect on haunches, with nose pointed to the sky, a long lean timber wolf. Very good, well done. Okay, so yes, that must be the call of the wild, hey? <laughs> um, a I'm long a lean timber wolf. Could be trouble for Buck. <laughs> okay, nicely read, well done. Okay, so. Here you are, I've got a little friend for Buck now. Oops. Ah, yes, I see, yes. Impressive. <laughs> okay, there you go. Is he alright? He was smaller than Buck. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? But he's lean. <laughs> and we know that Buck is a pretty big doggy. <laughs> okay, so a couple of words for you. All right. Um, the first one is your old friend. And the reason why you can't ignore the old is because when you said toiled, it sounded like toyed, okay? I see. So to toy with toiled. somebody, but toiled. 